what's up? Long time no, you know. Anyway, the Macintosh. The OG Macintosh had an anniversary to pretty much no fanfare from Apple, which is sad, but that led me to this video. This was kind of the launch of the Macintosh. No, not that launch, but kind of showing it off to the mass public type of launch. And by the way, this is the Computer Chronicles, and they have like all other episodes online. And if you're a nerd like me, you're going to love that channel. But the point is, who is that? Who is this person showing off the Macintosh? It's not Steve Jobs or Steve Wozniak. Hell, it's not even Andy Hertzfeld, if you want a deeper name drop. So who is this? Well, to just name drop her wouldn't do her justice. No, instead, I'd rather tell you this person changed the way we interact with computers. She's kind of the reason you have a phone, laptop, or computer that you're watching this on right now. She kind of maybe started a slight singularity moment. Hang on, let me look that up. Mm hmm So, a future point in time in which technology growth becomes uncontrollable and irreversible, resulting in unforeseen consequences for human civilization. Yeah, that kind of happened, and it happened because of this graphic designer and this computer. Let me explain. So this is Susan Carr, and she is one of the first, if not the first, UI UX designer for a major computer company. And I know, there were other companies making UIs for other computers with kind of the same goal in mind, and we'll get to them, but when they developed those interfaces, they didn't consult a designer. They were all engineers, and engineers, I, I love you guys, but hire a designer, trust me on this, you'll be very happy. But before we get into the designer, we need to talk about the prologue. In the late 70s, Xerox, with their Elto computer, created the first interface called Parse. It was later ported to a computer called the Xerox Star, but it was in no way user-friendly and really wasn't marketed to consumers. Instead, it was a tool for office users. It wasn't elegant, it was utilitarian, but a young entrepreneur saw that machine and had an idea, an idea to make that interface user-friendly. And if you know, you kind of know. Jobs is now only 26 years old, is Apple's chairman of the board. Stephen Jobs is a 27-year-old multimillionaire whose large fortune is built on something little, the personal computer. So we don't think the home is quite yet ready, uh, either culturally or economically. Hate him or love him, Steve Jobs had a vision for a perfect interface, but he didn't have the creative insight on how that would actually look. Originally, the first Macintosh GUI or graphical user interface looked like this. Well, at least the prototype did. It was there, you can see what they were trying to do, but it wasn't elegant, it wasn't iconic, it wasn't Apple. They needed a designer. In came Susan Carr, a young designer who had a taste for typography. In 1954, she went to Mount Holyoke College to study art. She then went to NYU and got her PhD in fine arts, later joining the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. She was a photo typesetter and did some sculptural work on the side. And you might be thinking, how did we get from a typographer to one of the most iconic interfaces known to man? Andy Hertzfeldt, a key member of the original Apple Macintosh development team, gave Susan a call to see if she wanted to come in and design icons for a new computer operating system. And of course she said yes. We're designers, of course. I'm not doing that joke, not doing that, not doing that. When she got the interview for Apple, she went to the local library and took out all the typography books there were to make a good impression. She wanted to look like she knew the part for the interview, however. 
She was tasked with creating icons using grid paper. Apparently they loved her designs, so she was hired right then and there. And when Susan joined Apple in 1982, she was initially tasked with creating the fonts and graphics for the Macintosh's user interface. At that time, most computers relied on text-based interfaces, but Carr envisioned something different. She believed that computers should be accessible to everyone, even those without technical expertise. This drove her to develop a visual language that would bridge the gap between users and machines. And that was the missing link from Xerox. They had the vision, they just didn't know how to execute it. And I think we've seen countless times, if it's not intuitive, if it's not easy to understand, it dies before the first revision. And I've seen interviews with the engineers about Parse, and it seems like it could have been better than what we got. But that's a story for someone far more familiar with that operating system than me. So in reality, Susan had nothing to go by. She had no reference work, she had no examples, and any icon she used as inspiration was probably for print. It wasn't meant to be used digitally. Hell, digital design wasn't even a thing really. Digital art maybe, but digital design, interface design, no. She had to invent that herself or interpret what we do in the real world to a digital world. This was a new frontier for designers. I mean, this is what computer interfaces look like. There was no design, no graphical interfaces. Computers, especially consumer facing computers, didn't look like this. Just under 10 years before the Macintosh, we had this as a consumer-oriented computer. So working closely with the Macintosh team, Susan began designing a series of graphical icons that would represent various functions and applications. Due to the limited display resolution of the early Macintosh, she had to work within a strict grid system with each icon measuring only 32 by 32 pixels. I mean, don't forget, the Mac interface was one bit at a 512 by 384 resolution, so she was pretty limited. And this machine was going to be in the hands of someone who has never touched a computer before. At most, people had an electronic word processor, but we were still living in the realm of typewriters. I mean, people were actually called computers back then still. Actual computers, because they were computing. And they were these big, bulky machines that IBM used and took up an entire room. Susan designed these icons so the person using the Mac would visually understand what they do. She utilized iconography as a form of language, and we see it everywhere, from street signs to emojis to signs on the back of trucks. Icons are a type of universal language. A person from Germany and a person from the United States wouldn't understand if one of them said, I was sad. But you show them a sad emoji and they'll instantly understand. So yeah, iconography is powerful, but how do you translate programs into icons? We've heard of skeuomorphic design in the past, which was made famous by the iPhone, but even before that, Windows used skeuomorphic design to teach people how to use the start menu. Which if you're interested, you can watch in that iCard above because yours truly made a very in-depth video on that one. And for those of you that remember the launch of the first iPhone, you kind of understand their thinking. There were a lot of firsts on the original iPhone and Apple made it easy for you to understand. Like the notepad looking like a notepad, the podcast player looking like a reel-to-reel. -reel. YouTube was literally a tube TV icon. It was designed to be familiar to you, a translation from physical to digital. And that is what Carr was doing. Think about it. That's why the trash can looks like a trash can, because that's where you put unwanted files. You know that's a place where junk or unwanted items go. She designed the Mac's main partition icon as a folder because it's a place you can store multiple programs or data files, just like in real life, when you have paperwork, you put it in a folder. And we still use folder icons today. Even though we know how to store items on a computer, that folder will always be there. Except on the iPhone, now we have groups, but you get the point. And unpopular opinion here, kind of like my older video on Brutalist Design, I kind of like skeuomorphic design. Come on. Anyway, she designed some of the most iconic icons still used today, and even have become integrated into pop culture and movies. Her designs transcended the computer to be a revolution in not just user interface, but a whole new genre of art and design. Take the Happy Mac. It was designed to alleviate anxiety when you start the computer. I mean, think about something you never used before and the anxiety you felt turning it on or using it for the first time. When you turned that computer on and saw a happy face, you knew you did something right. It was almost like the computer saying, hi, I'm Macintosh. Hello, I am Macintosh. It wasn't just a computing device, it was a friend, it was familiar, it was something you can easily use. And the face has a bit of a science behind it. The FFA, or fusiform face area of the brain, allows us to identify faces faster than objects. The face icon went beyond skeuomorphic design into anthropomorphic design. She made that Mac a character, she gave it emotion, she connected the computer to the user all in one simple bitmap icon. But there's more. 
the paintbrush and pencil. Cars pixelated paintbrush and pencil icon became synonymous with the Macintosh's graphical program, introducing users to the world of digital art and design. Which is interesting because you can see the same set of icons still being used in programs like Photoshop today. It's so universal, it's so perfect, it's hard to design something else around that. Another interesting one was the bomb icon. While not as cheerful as the others, the bomb icon symbolized a system error or crash. Its straightforward visual representation allowed users to easily identify when something had gone wrong, which apparently the developers told her no one would ever see, but we kind of know how that went. But that makes sense. Back then, even now, I bet a lot of you have seen this and not really sure what it meant, but this, this is pretty obvious. Susan drew inspiration from a variety of sources, including international symbols, everyday objects, and even playing cards. Her design process involved sketching the icons on graph paper and meticulously refining them to fit the constrained dimensions of the max resolution. Eventually, she started designing exclusively on the computer, becoming one of the very first pixel artists, or bitmap artists if you want to get technical with it. Oh, and one last thing, the control panel, which is basically how you customize the entire computer, was designed beautifully. The sound bar was intuitive. The utilization of a turtle and rabbit to show speed is a great way to represent a real world thing into digital. But don't think icons were the only thing she had a hand in. She was a typographer after all. The Mac needed typography just as much as it needed icons, but not just any font would do. It needed to be designed for the Mac. It needed to be designed for the mass consumer. Typefaces on computers usually look like this. It's monospaced, it's cold, it's utilitarian. It doesn't have personality, it wasn't friendly. Susan created typefaces with proportional spacing. Proportional gave them character, a design to them. She made them approachable. And these typefaces didn't just live their lives on the original Macintosh. If you ever had the first iPod, you may remember Chicago. Now, she worked at Apple until something happened to Steve Jobs. If you know, you know but eventually she left Apple to work at Next and become their creative director. And the rest, as we say, is history. But hold up, she did way more after that, like way more. She created her own agency and worked with a lot of people, including the legendary Paul Rand, someone who I definitely will be covering on this channel. She worked on Facebook Messenger icons. If any of you have ever used GIFs, which I have no idea what those are, but if you use them, you have heard a thing for that. But maybe the most interesting company she worked for is Microsoft with the original Solitaire program. Yeah, she designed these, probably one of the most badass of all badass pixel art in any video game. I mean, these decks are iconic and I might just do a video on these, but let's get back to Susan. She was a design consultant for IBM, Sony, Motorola, and Intel, just to name a few. And today you can even see her original sketchbook in the MoMA. I mean, she's done a lot. Her groundbreaking work on the Macintosh laid the foundation for modern graphical user interfaces. Her icon set a new standard for user-friendly design and made computing more accessible to the masses. In fact, many of her original designs have become timeless symbols still recognized and used in various digital contexts today. Her contribution, her legacy, might just be more important than Steve Jobs. But then again, Steve knew how to pick them. He saw the potential and used that to create something that wasn't there. They all created a revolution, a digital revolution in our lifetime. I mean, she's still alive doing work. She's a legit living legend. Anyway. Let me know if you know who Susan Carr is, if there's an icon you're familiar with, or if there's other digital designers you wanted to shout out. I just wanted to share her work with you because outside of designers and technology nerds like me, I feel she doesn't get the credit she deserves. She seems to be in the shadows of both Steve and Johnny eyes, but in reality, Johnny might not be the person he is without her. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you all next time. I promise it won't be more than six months.